Welcome to the Talberg Foundation podcast series, New Thinking for a New World. Host Alan Stoko welcomes leaders from around the world to explore the issues that are challenging and changing their societies. From climate change to democracy under siege to geopolitics and beyond, we are looking for ideas that can make all our lives better. London's Chatham House is one of the highest points in the global landscape of institutions thinking about and advising on global affairs. It was founded in July 1920 in the hope that unbiased, nonpartisan analysis, debate and dialogue could replace war as a way for nations to resolve differences. My guest today is Robin Niblett, who has led Chatham House since 27 and is himself an expert on British, European and American foreign policies. Welcome, Robin, and happy 100th birthday. Thank you very much, Alan. Great to talk to you in this special year. I've got to say, you don't look like a day over 50. <laughs> As no one else can see us, I'll let you say that. <laughs> you know, in some ways, 2020 feels a bit like 1920. The world's a mess, more global disorder than order. The great powers, today the Chinese and the Americans, seem to disagree on most things. The transatlantic dialogue is like a conversation among the deaf. The UK has left the EU and the Europeans are split north against south, east against west. China's pushing its neighbors. Russia's pecking at Europe's borders. Political, social unrest, even small wars all over the place. Let me start with a simple question. Although each of those has its own story, is there something more fundamental going on? Are the geopolitical tectonic plates shifting? Um, well, the, the, I think the simple answer to that, Alan, would be to say yes. I think those famous tectonic plates are shifting. I mean, they're always potentially mobile. So even when they're stable, they give the appearance of stability, um, but one always has to guard against instability. Uh, undoubtedly, we have hit a moment now where the scale of China's rise over the last 20 or so years, maybe 30 years, if you give it a bit of a run up to when it joined the WTO around 2000. So China, the scale of China's rise, the, the weight that it brings now both to global economics, finance, and increasingly politics means that we have entered a world which we've not experienced for a long time of two clear superpowers. Um, You could argue the last time we had that was in the Cold War with the Soviet Union and the United States. So, you know, given that that ended sort of around about 1990, that would be 30 years ago. What I would say now is that although it's a more complex world, you've got other powers in the mix, Russia still being very much uh, a global player, There is something about the U.S.-China standoff and tension, which is more than just a bilateral conflict. It is starting to acquire something of a of a global remit. So in that sense, I'd say the tectonic plates have shifted in that China's rise, the most populous country, pretty much, uh, give or take a few hundred million with India, the most populous nation in the world, is acquiring the economic and military and political might to go with that size. And this is a a new phenomenon um, that we've not experienced, I've not experienced um, in in my lifetime. You know, the United States had that clear leading position, even though it did not have the massive population, uh, the largest population in the world. So I think that that's a big shift. I I would note, because you said there's some parallels with the 1920 period here. Of course, 1920 was sort of a time of hope. Uh, It was a time of hope because the First World War had ended. The League of Nations had been inaugurated, even though the United States pulled out at the last minute. But there was a belief that somehow people would avoid a return to war, uh, the sort of devastation that the First World War had experienced. Uh, We'd not yet had the Great Depression. We'd not yet had the rise of populist parties in Europe, in Italy, in Germany in particular, the rise of fascism. Uh, communism looked like it was containable at that point. I suppose what I want to say about 2020 is that, you know, we don't stand here ready to go back to the future. I think we've learned many lessons. We've learned the lessons of great power standoff. Um, and we've learned the lessons of how to deal with uh, 
global risks. And I'm hopeful that these can be applied to the future. Well, let me pull on that thread because you, one could make a case that the lessons that were learned from the Cold War, managing the Cold War, were unique to that period. That, as you said, the rise of China, the first country in the modern period that did not shape the modern period. It was outside the system. It clearly was not contemplated to be a great power in the system, but it is now. So do we need to start all over as we ended up doing 100 years ago? Um, it's a good question. I think the people who perhaps have learned the most important lessons from the Cold War period and its ending are the Chinese. So one of the interesting questions here is to what extent that they will try to discipline their own rise or manage it such that they do not create the counter uh, reactions that the emergence of the Soviet Union and its efforts to spread communism around the world did. So I think that's the first important point to make. I think we have in China a superpower that's aware of the risks to its own security and its own future of overplaying its hand. Um, and so it won't just be up to us to control China's rise. China itself is trying with difficulty, I might say in some ways, to, to affect that. Um, the lessons are different. As you said, China is deeply integrated into the global economy, something that was not the case with the Soviet Union. Uh, but there is something ideological about its rise, which is its belief in the primacy of the state over the individual. And this runs so much counter to the Western system, if I can call it that, of liberal democracies, um, in which the state is meant to serve the individual. Uh, and where the checks and balances of our systems of government between judiciary, executive branch, legislative branch, media, etc., are meant to be the guardians. Um, China is bringing onto the stage uh, with scale a completely different approach. And what I'm worried about is that we may be in the foothills of an ideological contest that would then start to carry some of the uh, uh, images or mirrors of the Cold War context with the Soviet Union, despite China's efforts not to let that happen. Um, so you're right, there are profound differences, but I think we've learned just in these last three to four years that the idea that China can remain fully integrated in a global economy and that other countries can permit it to be as integrated as it was becoming, while having a completely different political system, one that is, in a way, so counterintuitive uh, and counter values to that of the West means that um, that may have been a false dawn of China's full integration of the global economy. And we're into something more contested. Right. And that's a segue to globalization, because clearly we had expected a few years ago that the continued integration, uh, not just of China into the global economy, but of the European and American co economies with China would continue apace. Now we have a rising chorus of voices demanding reshoring, seeking to restrict foreign investment, particularly Chinese investment, arguing the creation for national champions to stand up against the Chinese. And that's across a whole range of both arguably modern and not quite so modern industries. Efficiency seems to demand global scope and integration. Politics wants something else. What do you think the future holds for globalization? Um, there is, as you yourself noted, this pushback against globalization that comes from many directions, partly the fear that China will dominate it and pervert it, partly the fear brought about by the COVID-19 pandemic that we cannot afford to be as interdependent um, as we have been. I would say that on the other side of the ledger, and everything, of course, has got its yin and yang, um, is the rise of global middle classes, not least in China, and the desire to preserve, if we possibly can, um, a resilient middle class in Western societies. And we know those middle classes have been under pressure, to put it mildly, through the recent years of globalization. How do you sustain a wealthy and growing middle class in the West, in China, in emerging markets in Latin America, across Asia, Pacific, for example, and at the same time give up the globalization, the specialization, the flow of investment, the flows of money, uh, the flows of jobs that went with it, of technology, that in a way we're allowing a worldwide rise in 
uh, human income and, and, and welfare. If we were to stop the globalization process today, we would be leaving at least half the world's population, probably two thirds of it, in a form of poverty that would lead us to, to, to a Mad Max world of sort of borders where like, a bit like Europe faces across the Mediterranean, you're trying to keep out the rest. And so I, I resist slightly this idea that globalization's uh, hit its apogee, that it's going to start declining uh, uh, as a result. Um, now, that's a sort of positive <laughs> look. Just one little comment on this would be that there might be a halfway house, which be regional globalization. In other words, that you regions try to create their own networks to provide those gains without depending on the whole world. That would be something interesting to explore. The question is whether that is consistent with, on the one hand, as you just said, global economic expansion, and on the other hand, global peace, so peace and prosperity. The world of borders is clearly a second best world, but politicians seem quite inclined to, to sort of gamble down that pathway. Um, you know, let me, let me just pick up your last point first, that a world of borders is second best. I, I've had to give this quite a bit of thought in the last four to five years, or four years certainly, since Brexit, and even the lead up to the British vote to, to leave the European Union. Um, and I suppose what I've come to the conclusion of is that you cannot make global politics or globalization something apolitical. You cannot take the politics out of human life and human engagement. And it's ironic that the two countries that were in the vanguard of globalization, the ones who defined the term Anglo-Saxon economics, low regulation, open market, free movement of capital, you know, the, 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 the two, you know, red in tooth and claw form of globalization, that those two countries, the UK and the US, are the two that seem to have pulled back most violently from uh, its continued expansion. And in both cases, the narrative of America first, the narrative of take back control in the UK, was playing to this human sense of insecurity when faced with with the pure openness of globalization. And I think what we're trying to grapple with now in this post-Brexit, post-Trump election period is a better balance between understanding still the value of national narratives, national identities to enable political organization and forms of political stability and the need for global interaction, which delivers the prosperity part that you were mentioning. And my conclusion is we were probably going too far or certainly we we're going too fast in the process of globalization in the 2010s, uh, 2000s to, to, to 2010s, and that a period of pause of allowing national debates and those who were excluded from the process of globalization to feel that they have some sort of skin in the game is essential. So a key point I want to make here is that, you know, globalization and peace <laughs> Um, don't necessarily go hand in hand if citizens start to feel insecure. And if they feel their governments cannot protect them, which is the ultimate thing you ask from your governments, then very dangerous things uh, start to flow after it. Uh, during these podcast conversations over the last weeks with people around the world, I've heard a lot of almost dystopian worries about the consequences of a second, a possible second Trump term. So let me ask. Not what you think will happen in the United States, but what you concerns might be about a second Trump term in terms of the impact on Britain, on Europe, on global peace and prosperity. Um, I think the world can cope with a second Trump term. I think it's almost healthy, well, almost, I think it is healthy for America's allies to wean themselves off over-dependence on American protection. I think it's healthy for world institutions to learn how to operate without having to rely on America as a sedeo sex machina, you know, a kind of outside power to come and help them continue to provide leadership. And uh, I think we need to acquire a greater global resilience than this constant dependence on U.S. leadership would require. And, and I'm, you can tell what I'm saying here is that I do not believe that Donald Trump is capable of providing global leadership. He's never claimed to want to. <laughs> 
Um, he wants to provide American leadership, uh, and that's it. So I think the world could cope. Um, some more in international institutions might lose American membership or, or fall by the wayside. I, you know, just as one example, the, the Paris Climate Agreement, if, Amer if America did fulfill his pledge to withdraw entirely, which would take place, I believe, literally the week after the U.S. election, then we've got to remember the Paris Agreement is combined of what's called nationally determined contributions. It is not some legally binding agreement on every country. It is like a club of a club of committed values. Um, and without America, other countries will need to get on and, and try to do it without it. Uh, the thing that worries me more, or the thing that worries me the most, maybe is the right thing to say about a second Trump term, is what it would do to the United States. And the United States, as the uh, world's largest still today economy, as the center of the global financial system, um, as the upholder of and backer of some very important military alliances around the world, both in Europe, but also across parts of Asia. Um, the danger of a United States that, that goes into a real political tailspin worries me the most, because I think if Donald Trump were to win, which is the world you're asking me to, to, to describe, it will have been by an extremely close margin, and it will be seen to be contested, just as if Donald Trump loses by a very close amount margin, it will, he will contest it. Uh, and uh, I am concerned about, uh, I've tended to be relatively sanguine given America's long history, its checks and balances, its strong judiciary, but just looking at America of the last six months, looking at the rise of gun sales, looking at the kind of rhetoric that is spilling out and looking at America's very unique political history as a, as a, a group of individuals who, who fled repressive governments in Europe, principally when it was established, and therefore not willing to accept repressive governments as they might interpret them in America. I'm, I'm worried about what would happen to America internally. And that would, if it were to go badly wrong, that would carry some very negative uh, repercussions globally, ultimately. Um, I think Europe, to your point there, um, Europe can get away with it uh, in the sense that uh, Russia is not about to invade Europe with tanks if America were to pull out of NATO or something like that. Um, Russia has its own ways of trying to undermine or destabilize European governments that have very little to do with the military and plenty to do with disinformation. And really, it's up to Europeans to try to fix that. Um, a country like Taiwan, you know, that kind of flashpoint thing where a country like China might misread America's withdrawal or, or lack of commitment, that would give me pause for concern uh, at a global level. Um, you know, Britain, if Trump were in power and Boris Johnson remains the prime minister in the UK, I think that relationship's okay. Um, and any case, the one point I wanted to make at the end of all of this is, is just to throw a question almost back to, for us all to think about. You know, what if Trump Mark II isn't like Trump I? When Trump won, needs to get reelected to be Trump too. And he, his decision is the way he gets reelected is by playing to his base and, and really whipping up the fury that helped him get elected the first time. And we will see if it pays off or not. But if Donald Trump were to win a second term, then he has to start thinking about the legacy. Legacy for his family, legacy for the Trump brand. Um, and I could see it being just as possible, he's a transactional man, if nothing, he's in nothing, um, him trying to go, you know what, maybe that climate change thing, I'll, I'll turn my hand to it. And Jared Kushner and his daughter will be advising him, you know, to, to, to show the soft side of, of Trump. Um, I'm sure he'd want to pull some surprises, uh, like a businessman would. Um, people who think they bought one thing, he won't need the base the way he needed it before. So I, I'm just wondering, a, a Trump too might look, Ultimately, if one were able to get past the, the crisis moment I described, um, it might become something different. But hey, it's all guesswork. Uh, on balance, I'd be worried. Let me end with a short question about a big topic, which is the long run consequences of Brexit. Let's put aside hard, soft December, put aside whether international law has been violated or not violated. What is Five years from now, what is the UK like outside the European Union, 
And conversely, what is a European Union like without the United Kingdom as the center of gravity shifts eastward? I think a lot will depend on how the government plays its hand. Economically, there is no reason why in five years, in five years, the UK should not be growing at a decent pace, a pace commensurate with its position as a developed economy with uh, a pretty innovative tech sector relative to many other parts of the world, with a young and still growing population, which is quite different to most of continental Europe, um, that would be open to foreign investment. And despite everything that was said around the Brexit vote, will be pretty open to immigration. All things being equal, the UK should be able to be growing at a uh, at its historic level um, and be relatively uh, well off. A lot depends, of course, on how its main markets in Europe uh, are performing and whether the EU is healthy or not. I think the uh, interesting part of Brexit is that if the government can use it to do what it needed to do, which is to rebalance uh, the British economy away from an overstimulated South to an underincluded North, and from, let's call it an overstimulated service sector, uh, high-end service sector, to an under-invested uh, lower-end service sector. If Britain could create more equitable um, and inclusive forms of growth, it'll actually be healthier politically as well as economically in the future. Britain did not need to leave the EU to do this. Let me just put my cards on the table. I argued against Brexit. Um, what I'm more worried about is whether Britain is a constructive player internationally at a time when the world desperately needs constructive players internationally. If the US has less influence in 2025 than it does in 2020 globally, which I think is likely, if China has continued to rise, uh, et cetera, then we're going to need other countries to step up and carry some of the load. And to answer the second part of your question, the EU will undoubtedly be weaker without the UK in it. Uh, the EU will be more inward looking than it would have been with the UK in it. Um, it will be probably a bit more conflicted as well, because it's left with that Franco-German uh, divide over the future of Europe. Germany, who wants a more federally integrated, politically integrated Europe, and France in a way that wants a Europe that allows France to be stronger and the member states to be stronger. And that divide is, it permeates the EU. It splits into the central and eastern countries who tend to be skeptical, uh, and it splits into some political parties, as we know, in Italy and France, in Netherlands and others. So I'm worried that the EU, without the UK in it, will be a little weaker and therefore a less constructive force on the world. And the UK is going to have to be incredibly disciplined and creative to turn itself into a constructive, mid-sized player that doesn't have the kind of clout that I think the Brexiteers believe it has, and where the world is not sitting there like an open oyster waiting for Britain to dive in and do brilliant Brexity stuff to it. Um, you know, the, the, the world is going to be skeptical of Brexit Britain, and you're going to need to have, I would say, a more humble Britain. The spirit that animated Brexit was buccaneering and individualism. But the Britain that the world needs to be constructive is one that's a team player and that's inclusive. And that adjustment may be impossible for the Boris Johnson government to make. And we may have to wait for a future Conservative or Labour government to make that adjustment. You mentioned at the start that 100 years ago, there was a lot of hope having just come out of a disastrous war. And that hope was ultimately frustrated by another disastrous war. Today, there's a lot of despair almost everywhere. Should we be more hopeful? Um, I think the world is in the process of a profound shift. It's late in this shift, but it's in the midst of a profound shift late to a more sustainable way of and productive and healthy way of living on this planet. It doesn't mean bad stuff won't happen or the bad people won't do bad things. But when I look at the spirit that animates the next generation in the UK, in many of the young people that we have involved in Chatham House projects, uh, we have a thing called a Common Futures Conversation that has a next generation young people from Africa, young people from Europe, designing their own idea of what they want the future to look like. When I see 
their sense of commitment, engagement, their sophistication, to be frank, and their unwillingness to be pigeonholed in old political tropes, that makes me optimistic. It makes me optimistic that we are moving slowly but inexorably towards a more 50-50 world in terms of gender. If we can get through this moment of danger to a more 50-50 led world in politics, in business, in, in all walks of life, that will be a more sustainable, resilient world, I suppose. And my third part is technology. I think technology is moving at such a pace and combined with human ingenuity is providing answers to things we never thought could be fixed in the past. So although I despair about where we are on climate change today and the latest reports coming out from the World Wildlife Fund and and the last 50 years of habitat and animal destruction, two thirds of animal species uh, destroyed, um, I feel at the moment where that is going to turn. But, uh, you know, I am by DNA optimistic, but I look at those elements, the next generation, the 50-50 world, the promise of technology, And I think it's up to all of us to do our bit to ensure those positive forces win out over the old stuff that I think uh, the Donald Trump presidency represents. Well, thank you very much for spending time with me today and with our listeners. I think it's quite clear, certainly to me and anyone listening to this conversation, that you and your colleagues at Chatham House clearly have an important role to continue to play as this brave new world evolves, hopefully in the positive directions that you just suggested. And thank you for listening to this episode of New Thinking for New World. Please let us know what you think the future holds and how we can better cope with it. Thank you for listening to this episode of the New Thinking for a New World podcast. We welcome your comments and please subscribe to other episodes in the podcast app of your choice. This podcast was made possible with the generous support of the Stavros Niarchos Foundation.